Hi, I'm Jake Gorst, producer and director of the documentary film Frey, The Architectural Interpreter, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. In our ongoing series, Children of Genius, we've spoken with Raymond and Dion Neutra, sons of Richard Neutra, Guillaume Schindler, great-grandson of Rudolf Schindler, Randy Koenig, son of Pierre Koenig, Susan and Eric Saarinen, children of Eero Saarinen, Eric Lloyd Wright, grandson of you-know-who, Frank Lloyd Wright, and Emily Ain, daughter of Gregory Ain. Today, we meet Annie Guathme, daughter of internationally famous architect Charles Guathme. He was one of the New York Five, a group that included Peter Eisenman, Michael Graves, John Hedgick, and Richard Meyer. They dominated modernist architecture in the 1970s. And now, speaking of domination, your host, (laughs) with just over 93 followers on Instagram, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Hi, folks. We've got some really great shows coming up. We recorded them at Kyle Bergman's New York Architecture and Design Film Festival, one of the largest events showcasing architecture documentaries in the world. Each year, I travel to New York to interview producers, directors, and sometimes the stars. And we'll have two shows coming up covering everything from the new Bauhaus to the Sydney Opera House. Back here in the studio with me today is guest co-host Paige wagner Clausen, an architectural historian, a real professional, whose Instagram feed, Classhouse, which she will spell for you later, has over 5,600 followers. So she's rocketing her way up to Kim Kardashian status. <laughs> Paige graduated and taught at the College of Charleston, and she has a master's in architectural history from UVA. She's a consultant in preservation planning, cultural resource consulting, arts education, and public-private projects. Welcome, Paige. Hi. Thanks for having me. So what's the significance of the New York Five? Oh, gosh, that's a big question. Um, They were sort of the avant-garde, the real rock stars of architecture. Like John, Paul, George, Ringo, (laughs) and a fifth guy? Yes, in the (laughs) 1970s. They were sort of, they're almost the first real celebrity architects, I think. Um, And they were a group, this sort of a loosely associated group, maybe some might say publicity stunt, but they were banded together for this book, Five Architects, that was published in 1972, and it it made some real waves. Yeah, I mean, it worked. I mean, they got known all over the planet. (laughs) It's true. It's pretty incredible. It is. And what kind of projects are you working on lately, Paige? Well, um, I took a little time off when I had my son, and so now I'm doing some modernism blogging, obviously, some little speaking events and uh, house histories, some some little projects keep me busy. I understand you've been uh, investigating some uh, houses of a certain type for a small country in Europe? I have. <laughs> Swiss Miss? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> He said drop Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't a big enough hint for me. I was like, which country? Liechtenstein? Um, I was like, hmm. Well, no, I, the last time I was in Palm Springs, I was totally smitten with the Swiss Miss houses. I have now come after a little bit of research and talking to some people who are preserving them in Palm Springs. I've come to find out that they want to sort of coin a new term for them, a low house. A low house, okay. I believe that's the, hopefully I'm getting that right. Or low a, like L-O-W? No, like aloha, like a oh. low house. Oh, um, I get it. And they do have that sort of Polynesian revival, you know, sort of flair to them, I guess you could say. So, yeah, so maybe something will come out about that soon on, on the blog, maybe. I think the Swiss Miss people should come back with a huge <laughs> promotional campaign to recapture their architectural heritage, you know, with the cocoa and the, and the marshmallows. Right. So I guess the Swiss Miss was a misnomer that a real estate agent uh, came up oh. with um, when it really has nothing to do to with it. To do with it at all? Right. right. Mm-hmm. With those realtors. Yes. All right. Well, speaking of that, U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll and by Nichiha.com slash U.S. Modernist. Beauty, love, durability, designed to last for years to come, bringing you peace and tranquility. You feel relaxed, knowing your house can easily achieve any 
exterior look and any color. Wood. Concrete. Your house loves dealing this good. And you love dealing this good. Nietzsche. 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 Say it with me. Nietzsche. Advanced engineering. Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Durability. Textures. Finishes. And colors. Visit Nietzsche.com slash US Modernist. Nietzsche. 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 That's in. Charles Guathme was a native of Charlotte, North Carolina, and got interested in architecture at an early age. His uncle was Walter Hook, a respected Charlotte architect whose work included Mercy Hospital, Carolina's Medical Center, and Presbyterian Hospital. Guathme's grandfather was C.C. Hook, who designed projects at Duke University for over 30 years. After his family moved to New York City, he attended the LaGuardia High School of Performing Arts, graduating in 1956. He studied architecture at the University of Pennsylvania and at Yale University under the great Paul Rudolph. Guathme went into partnership with Richard Henderson and later Robert Siegel, and the firm lives on without Guathme or Siegel as Guathme Siegel Kaufman. Guathme's daughter, Annie Guathme, is an actress, producer, and teacher known for films such as Romeo Must Die, which was Jet Li's breakout role in the U.S., and My Father's House. She attended Cornell and Sarah Lawrence College and speaks to us from Los Angeles. She's been very patient as we worked out scheduling issues, and I'm thrilled to have her on. Welcome, Annie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's nice to finally talk to you. Oh, yeah. Your mom is the writer Emily Margolin Guathme, Author of the books that is correct. Lots of Luck, A Box of Kisses, and Holy Cow, which is a really cute book about cows. Um, how's she? It is. How's she doing? She's doing very well. She lives out here in Santa Monica. I followed her here. She also wrote a book about elephants, and that one didn't get mentioned. But um, yeah, she's she's written thirteen books actually, and she used to work in advertising and copywriting in New York. But she's doing she's doing quite well. And how and when did your parents meet? Oh boy! Well, they met they met in high school at LaGuardia. I think it was a music music and art. She has a twin sister, Barbara. They were both in love with my father, but my father chose my mother. Uh oh! <laughs> that sounds like a plot out of a Disney movie. Really? I know. Well, a Disney. Oh my lord! More like out of a Dickens novel. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, they, that that's how they met, and um, they're, actually their families were very close because my father's family they were on the um, on East Tenth Street in New York, and my mom and her sisters and her family were on the Upper West Side. But anyway, needless to say, they their their families were known to each other. They were very like socially active and civil rights activists, and they got to. They got to be friends, and before my mom, well, this is a story. My mom, <laughs> my mom had a huge crush on my father. They were friends, but she was very quiet. And so her mother suggested that they go over to the Guasmi's house and you know knock on the door. And my dad answered the answered the door in a towel, and that <laughs> basically that 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 ended it. <laughs> and thus I was born. No, I was I, that was many many years later. But yeah. They, <laughs> <laughs> they were married for um, eleven years, so so through most and, of the sixties and early seventies, roughly. Yeah, in the in in the late fifties, and then I was born in sixty eight. But they divorced. They divorced when I was one, but my father remarried Betty Ann Steele when I was five. But my my parents, my mom and my dad, were close always. So. Now, your dad made it big on the architecture scene, 
like several other architects, uh, Richard Meyer comes to mind, by designing yes. a house for your grandparents, Robert and Rosalie. Um, That's right. You must have spent a lot of time there. What's what's that house like? Oh, my Lord. That house is the best thing ever. I mean, I grew up, I, mean, I, I was spoiled because I, I just like took that my dad, my dad was a genius and I, I got to visit all the places he was considering building or renovating. And this one I did not because I wasn't born yet, but I did spend a great deal of time there. And it's, it's like a, hmm, it, it reminds me of a ship and it was, it's an iconic building and it was, it was built in 1965 and my dad actually helped build it. And the main house is sort of, how do I, how, how can I best describe this? There's, there's a 480 like square foot structure, which was added, which is, was my grandfather, Robert Quasme's studio where he painted. And that's just sort of like, it just fits right into the property. It just sort of reflects the, the main building. So, but the house is great. There was a mural there. It's, it's very, very extremely open. It sort of looks like a, uh, it reminds me of a ship, but it has like a silo. There's a lot of open window area, a lot of, a lot of area, a lot of, a lot of things to see. And it feels very open and, and bright. Where is the house? The house is in Amagansett, Long Island, in the Hamptons, in the, in the lesser known of the Hamptons. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're basically, they're like minimalist geometric forms and they're like, they look to be carved from, uh, from like a, a solid volume, um, rather than like constructed with additives. But my dad built it himself. I mean, he used he really hired Johnny Caramagna. He hired some local construction people, but he took part in building it. So how was it being a kid in that house? I imagine it, the house was just a kid magnet as well as an adult magnet. Oh, well, I was just in heaven. I mean, I had two stepbrothers and a stepsister, and we all, and they're right next door. Eventually, they built Michael Tolan's house. My father built that, and that had a tennis court and a pool table, which is dangerous for five- to eight-year-olds to be playing with, but, sure. <laughs> and, and a pool and it was just amazing to be in. And my grandmother, Rosalie, and my grandfather, Bob Gwathme, they were Southern. They were social. People were always coming in and out. Um, I was always running around. I thought I could fly. That was the problem. But, but I mean, because it, it, it didn't really happen. But I tried to convince my grandmother that it had happened. And I, got, I loved spending time in the studio with my grandfather, who was a painter, and to just, like, hang with him and watch him paint. But it was a great place to be in. And they let me, I mean, I'm an artist, so they just, would like, put me under a table and let me draw. And Annie, I love that house, but how did the world react to it? Oh, boy. <laughs> I don't really know. Well, the world, I mean, they were in shock. There's sort of a very, there's a really interesting, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's called The Search of Clarity. It's a documentary that my dad made with, I think, Alice Shore and Stanley Jaffe. And first they were like, who are, what's going on here? And then this really hysterical um, <laughs> local, I think he was a local farmer, he was like, well, I, w I walked by the house and I saw Robert Gwathme peeing under a tree. And I thought, well, he's just like us. <laughs> so he's all they right. Kind of, they kind of accepted, they accepted them. Um, yeah, it was, it was strange for what had been going on. Um, extremely modern, not what anyone was used to. And it's uh, it's like on one acre of a flat field, and it was surrounded by underdeveloped land, and it's very close to the beach as well. And it got published everywhere. Oh, everywhere! And people, I'm to this day. I mean, sadly, I don't get to go there anymore because my stepmother and stepbrother, which is a whole tragic tale, but I don't really get to um, to go there. But I grew up there and my grandmother was a photographer. So she was always taking beautiful pictures. And there's a lot of, it's just, it was like a magical house. There was amazing art in it. Yeah, it was, it was great. It was great. My dad was also very athletic. So we were always like racing in the yard and he was playing competitive tennis with an eight-year-old and you know, that kind of thing. 
But what did you hear about the reaction to the house? Well, I have a story for you, and it's from approximately 1968 when you were born. Okay. Your dad was not a licensed architect at the time. When he did take the professional licensing exam, he was surprised to see a multiple choice question on the test, which asked, which of these is the organic house? Huh? And the choices included the house he designed for his parents, the one we've been talking about. Oh, that's about. right. He was in it. It right. was him. <laughs> and it also included Frank Lloyd Wright's famous falling water house. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> he knew that the answer they wanted was Frank Lloyd Wright, and he picked that, and he passed the exam. Well, that was he a did. close call. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he didn't say that. He tells it differently. Okay, He's tell like, me, tell me his my name. Well, no, he just said that everybody, well, he saw his name there, and he was like, you know what? I've arrived. I don't even need a license. Like, I'm on this test. <laughs> so That but is even, amazing. <laughs> 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 but he did pass. Yeah. Yes. He did pass and, and became an official architect, AIA, later uh, FAIA, honored with, with many kinds of awards. After yeah. your grandparents' house, he designed uh, many more imaginative breakthrough design houses throughout the early 70s. Did you get to visit any of those? I visited plenty of them. My memory is, is strange. I actually lived, well... Well, you would have been pretty little, right? Yeah. I mean, I was in the Kogan's house. The um, he, he renovated, or I think, I don't, yeah, he designed a, a house in Greenwich, Connecticut, and we would stay there together. Um, let's see. Throw some names at me, and I'll tell you if I've been there. Well, um, we've got one we want to ask you about specifically. We're hoping you remember a little sliver about, because for at least 10 years, we've been trying to find one of your dad's houses he did with Richard Henderson and Robert Siegel. It's the 1970 Lawrence House in Great Neck near Kings Point. This house appears only once in records we can find on a 1971 Guathme Siegel resume. But when Henderson left, he took the project credit when the partnership split. Do you recall this one at all? No, I don't. It has a stunning view over the water in Kings Point, but we can't really quite determine where it is. And our aerial yeah. searches through Google Maps have not turned it up yet. This is like trying to find Mayan ruins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. That that I'll I'll have to do a little research because I don't, I can't remember that at all. Well, we would love that. It's one of our uh, our missing white unicorns in the Charles Guasme <laughs> section. That that would it's always fun to find things like that for sure. What was your dad like as, as a person? Not just as an oh architect, God. but as a guy. As just as a guy who was your dad. Well, he was completely charming, incredibly intelligent, and because I think he had he had a stammer from the time till he was eighteen and he just decided to get over it and somehow did that. And because of that I think like like I've watched his Charlie Rose interview and I mean he's so intense in his word choices and his sort of like the way he articulates things. He was incredibly intelligent and he was kind of a he was a serious athlete, seriously competitive. He cursed a lot, especially playing sports, but it was okay. And incredibly generous person, really a, a, a perfectionist, really hard on himself. In fact, I spoke to a friend of his who he was in college with who said that at like three in the morning, he had, they had some models to complete. And at three, my father just broke it and then made a new one by four and got an A. So he, but he was like that, you know, if it's like, it's not working at a certain point, like he'll work on it for 20 hours and then he'll throw it away and start from scratch. Sounds like a, a scene from a movie that you might be filming. <laughs> Not yet, okay. but I could. I'm not sure you're going with that, George. <laughs> I don't know who I'll have star as my father. Who? Maybe Brad Pitt. I mean, that would be fun for me if I could have a small role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, but, your, your dad was, I mean, the photos I've seen of him. He was always super built. I mean, like really muscular. Yep. Was he always that way? Yes. His. I mean, he took his physical. Like he was crazy with his physical being. I mean, he 
he ran until he shattered both of his knees. He played tennis. I mean, he used to race me, and I was really fast. Uh, I beat him until I was like, I don't know, 11. Uh, but I but I think he probably let me get away with it. But he was a tremendous athlete. He was a really good tennis player. He was really good. What else? He had to have done some weightlifting with that body he had. Well, he, li- he liked to do chin-ups. He didn't really lift weights. He just, yeah, he just did like a lot of running and a lot of chin-ups and push-ups and sit-ups. To this day, I've, I've inherited this thing where he would just like in the middle of something drop to the ground and do like 10 push-ups. Um, which can be disconcerting, but it's also kind of like, you know, lightens the mood, I guess. Particularly <laughs> <laughs> if you're at a party and right. you just drop down and yeah. kind of like yeah, Jack like, Palance okay. at the Academy Awards. Yeah. Well, that goes yeah, back a ways. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And he swam and he loved the ocean. He loved the sun. The sun did not love him, but he loved the sun nonetheless. He was incredibly, he was an incredibly cool, adventuresome like, he introduced me to things that I'm so grateful for, just museums and culture and people that were, like, fascinating. And it was always very unpretentious. So they just were these, like, really, really interesting people that were off and around. Like who? Um, you remember? Um, well, yeah. Well, I remember Jacob Lawrence, who was a famous painter, who was good friends with my grandfather. And Ralph Lauren was a close friend. And... Let's see who else. This guy, Steve Potter, who was an amazing photographer, and Sandra and Ben, Daniel Weiner, who were both photographers, and the Vogel, Speed Vogel. I think he built them a house in Fire Island. And the Kogans were interesting. Just all kinds of really interesting people, and, and including the people in his office. They were all really interesting as well. Well, Annie, you were really lucky to have him as a dad. George has stepped out to check his Mr. Modernism Instagram feed. I think he's looking for number 94. But we'll be back in just a moment. Okay. In a classic tale that we are largely making up, realtor Angela Roll trained with the Navy SEALs, the first woman to complete the grueling program. On a mission to England, she infiltrated a royal wedding. But after accidentally spilling a bottle of Chateau Margaux 1787 on someone's mother who had Oops. a crown, Oops. her Oops. military record became classified, and she was burned notice to Krakow in Poland. Broke, with only a 9 millimeter Ruger, a circular saw, and a red ball gown to her name, she studied architecture by day and built portable dance floors by night. <laughs> It was on one of her dance floors at the Finnish embassy that she waltzed into the arms of international man of mystery Eric of Helsinki, whom she later married. On their honeymoon aboard the Queen Mary II, she performed the Heimlich Maneuver on Frank Gehry, (laughs) the resulting projectile inspiring a series of artworks by Millie Brown. Angela narrowly got her circular saw past customs in New York via her cloak of invisibility, because of course all heroines have one, to become a formidable real estate agent with architecture training, capable of brilliant advice to buyers and sellers of modernist houses. Angela Roll is your special agent. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or 919-995-0550. We're back. Okay, hi. Annie, although your dad died in 2009, his buildings and incredible modernist residences live on, many for celebrities like Jerry Seinfeld, Michael Dell, Faye Dunaway, Steven Spielberg, Marlo Thomas, and Phil Donahue, (laughs) uh, plus a lot of iconic buildings like the Guggenheim edition. How did he connect with the Hollywood crowd? Good question. They just loved him. They took to him. I mean, my well, my stepmother, Betty Ann Steele, he built her then-husband John Steele's parents' house and a house for them. And their Ruth and Arthur Steele are very wealthy. I'm not exactly sure what they're... But they, they knew a lot of people. He was very charming with the ladies. He met Faye Dunaway. He, um... Is this why he worked out? No, no. <laughs> just wondering. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get confused. No, he, it was for him, I think. Okay. 
But he, let's so he, see. He met Faye Dunaway, you were saying. Yeah, he met Faye Dunaway. He met Michael Tolan, who at the time was a very good actor, and he happened to buy the property next to my grandparents' house. And Spielberg came to him because he was like, I'm not, you know, nobody's really getting what I'm what I'm trying to, to ask for. And I know this may not be up your alley because I'd like a French barn or chateau. And my dad, you know, it, it's actually in this video, this, this search for clarity video. It's kind of funny. But he knew David Gessen and Jeffrey Katzenberg. It just was like through meeting, through, through word of mouth. And uh, I'm trying to think of the first thing was. I think in first chronologically, thing. it was probably Faye Dunaway's apartment. Was it? My mom was always very mad. She doesn't believe that he did his apartment. But I believe, I mean, I'm, I'm going to believe that he did actually do it. They went to Paris together, and that wasn't a good look for my mom. She wasn't pleased with that whole situation. Yeah. But I think he did do it. But he, like, Barbara Streisand notoriously, I, maybe this shouldn't air, but, but asked him to do her house. And he was like, you know what? I can't do this. You, you've got too many. Because essentially, he would he didn't like to be told what to do. He didn't really, especially if it was, extremely um, out of his taste league and out of his aesthetic. And she had a lot of requests that were sort of like that. And he just, he, he didn't want to do it. Well, he would do it for Spielberg. Why wouldn't he do it for Streisand? Because her taste is bad. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying, I mean, I'm not like, I don't really think that. I, I think that's what he thought. Okay. He just thought this is going to be problems. But he also did, I don't know if you know, like he did Ron Meyer's house along PCH, which is now currently up for sale for $125 million. Wow. Oh. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's an incredible price I'm tag. I'm thinking of buying it later, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm still in grad school, so so maybe not. Where do you get a mortgage for $125 million on a house, I wonder? If you, I don't know. If you need a mortgage for a $125 million house... You don't have enough money. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think I don't think there was a mortgage on that house. Is that possible? Mm. Oh, and I know, and he met the Demonils, Francois Demonil. He met a long while ago from a very wealthy family, and that was when that was a very beautiful house that he built out in the Hamptons with a with sort of an indoor outdoor greenhouse. It, it was amazing. Did you ever want your dad to design you a little modernist house? Mm, I wouldn't have, you know what, we looked at, we actually, this is so long ago, I should have listened to him, but I didn't because he's my dad, but we looked at a house in, um, on Rose in Venice, and he wanted to read you the whole thing, but I didn't buy it. I mean, I just love living in his house, like, I loved being in his apartment, I loved being in my grandparents' apartments, but there was a level of, I'm, I'm not the neatest person that's ever existed, and my dad doesn't have a high tolerance for that. So, I mean, they had a housekeeper who I, Malta, who's an amazing woman, who would come basically every every single day to my father's apartment in New York because he didn't like any sort of dust or... So you didn't inherit that OCD for uh, cleanliness that he did? Not, well, maybe I inherited it temporarily. It was a sickness, so it went away. But I mean, <laughs> I'm a painter, you know what I mean? Like, I'm a painter and I'm an art therapist, and so I'm not really, like, I, for, for me, as long as we clean it up at the end, I'm good, and, like, stains aren't going to send me over the edge. You know, I, I appreciate cleanliness and I appreciate like the beauty and the modernity. And lately I've been looking at a lot of the furniture he designed and it's just like, I mean, it's, it's insane. It's so beautiful. Well, modernism does force you to not have a lot of stuff or put it away somewhere. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, and he loved art, and so he was very specific about what kind of art he thought would look good where, had a lot of opinions about it. But he was, he, he was reasonable at times. He was, you know, he, would, he can listen to suggestions, and he wanted to please his clients, of course. Well, Annie, that leads, kind of leads into this next question. Has your family's connection to architecture seeped into your consciousness? Did it affect your career to go into film? Well, I, I came from such a family of just incredible 
I felt like I was competing with geniuses. And, like, my grandfather was just this incredible painter. It took him an extremely long time to finish a paint, painting, but he was just, he was an incredible painter. And had a sort of focus, even though he was alcoholic, he had a focus that was, was quite incredible. Um, and my dad, too, was, you know, so seemingly could do... I mean, I'd seen him frustrated, but I, he, he did such amazing things. And I acting, I've been doing since I was like a, a little girl and drawing the same way. But I felt a little more intimidated about the drawing as I got older. Even I went to Cornell for fine arts, but I got into every single production, which made every theater student there want to kill me. Um, but I loved it. It's a sort of thing. I love improvisation. I love comedy. I love being in the theater. And that was primarily what I did. And it felt like it was my own. And at, when my dad <laughs> my dad came and saw me perform at this, like, massive level production at Cornell, my dad saw me and I was like, oh, my God, I can't even believe you're my daughter. Like, I don't know who that – I just have no idea who that was up there. He was really proud. And – um so, yeah, so I took to that. I really, really liked it. And actually, I had, when I was at Sarah Lawrence, we, I, was, I got into scene design, into scenic design, and I got to work, in my, <laughs> work with my dad on creating these projects, and that was amazing. You know, I'd learned a lot from doing that, a lot, which I don't remember, but, but my professor was like, you need to do this. This needs to be your career. And I'm like, yeah, but my dad, but you don't understand. My dad really helped me. He's like, I don't care. <laughs> but it was really, it was like to be able to read the blueprint and not have it make no sense to me and kind of figure out some engineering things. It was really cool. That was a really cool thing. So and his focus influenced me, the, the level of concentration that's necessary to really do something well and give it give it your attention. A real laser focus. Yes. Oh my god. I mean, it was his love. Like, I mean, even though he was sick for some time, he went to the office every day. No one at the office was allowed to know that he was ill. And I think the work really um, supported his health, his mind, and just sort of it gave him it was his. It was his purpose and, and his passion. One of his most famous designs is the 1992 renovation edition on Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim Museum, which is a, a, a gold tower over Wright's spiraling icon. Uh, I assume yes. you've been there to visit? Well, not only have I been there to visit, I was working there at the time. Really? Oh. Tell us about that. Well, I was I was interning. I got into the internship program, but for in public affairs, and there was so much controversy about it. They're like, it looks like a toilet bowl. It looks like a this, and you know, my dad sort of just kind of tried to take it in. <laughs> he was, it didn't make him happy. But honestly, the interior of the Guggenheim was falling apart. It was not in good shape, and they needed space for offices and storage and restoration and the addition. And there's only really one way out of the Guggenheim that you can't, you know what I mean? So this created, it was, it was a really difficult time. It was controversial. People were putting up flyers of like, you know, this looks like, when do we flush it? Or, you know, just, it was just not, it, it wasn't cute, but eventually Guess what? It made a huge difference. He supported, I mean, he honored Frank Lloyd Wright, so he's not, he wasn't about to try and do something that was going to be like not honor what was already there. Just sort of try and sustain it and make room for offices and more space there. If you've ever been to the Guggenheim and seen this addition rising up behind it, you can see that it's a very difficult site. I mean, this is a, a huge design problem to figure out how to expand that site at all. Oh, definitely. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I'd probably put a swing in the air. Or I don't know. No, it was very, very challenging. He had one idea at one point to sort of open, I'm forgetting the details, but it was Ixnade. What do you remember most about your dad as you were an adult? 
I had a lot. I had a great deal of fun with him. I loved him so much, and um, you know, we traveled. He'd come out to visit me. We go to LACMA. We go. He just, just, he just introduced me to so many things, and just sort of like always knew what he wanted, and was wanting to try new places. And he, he, he built a lot of restaurants. I mean, I was sort of spoiled and privileged in this way that I got to like actually be friends with these people and see that this place, like be really proud of my father for having created it. He's always wanted to help me because I've had issues and he's always been extremely supportive. But I think I was like a challenge in that I'm not like, I, like I'm human. So you can't just make a plan and fix me. It's taken a little longer than I think he had anticipated, but like we had a really, really wonderful time together. I, at the last time I saw him, I, I got a job in Israel, even though my father is probably as far from Jewish as you can possibly get. I think he's first family Virginia, so they came across on the Mayflower or something. Huh. Not to, that that means anything. My mother's Jewish, so I'm Jewish ish ishy. Right, because um, it does follow the mom, doesn't it? Yes. According to the it rules. Does. But yes, but we were not, you know, we were not a religious, we didn't practice any religion. We we just more like socialists and social activism and he yes i went to israel i got a job on a kibbutz which was like the motel six of the kibbutzes in israel and the, and, 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 and the guy says he's like if you can make it here honey you're going to be able to make it anywhere which terrified me but my dad and i flew out there together and he stayed there with me for a few days and that was really really wonderful and and yeah and i worked there and it was great. I'm really grateful for that experience, even though at the, at the moment that he suggested it, I was like, Your step, my stepmother just wants me to leave the country. She just wants me far away. But my memories of my dad are just, I mean, he was always charming, he was always gracious. He's so, so, so kind and just a stand up kind of guy. Are there any of his buildings that you still would like to go see? Oh, my God, definitely. Well, I've seen many of them. The one that I don't think I will be able to see is my stepbrother's loft that he built, only because there's the family history that probably won't allow for that. And I went and visited the buildings he did at Yale, and it was a, it was a lake house, I think, in Austin. I think that was the Michael Dell house, probably. Yeah, the Dell house. For, yeah, for Dell Computer. Dell. I'd love to see that. I, I, it's beautiful. Um, and the Astor Place, the the condo that he built in Astor Place, I'd like to go inside there, perhaps, and maybe give that a look. Well, Marlo Thomas and Phil Donahue, if you're listening, you can invite Annie over for coffee sometime. Oh, they know me. They do. They know me, those two. Oh, yes, they did. Marlo Thomas, I did Free to Be You and Me. I was, I was, in, <laughs> I was in that, so I'll remind her. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And I you sang, have an I, 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 And I sang Reach Out and Touch Somebody's Hand with Rosie Greer on the album. So. Really? Yeah. That was a great show. That was one of the classic children's programs of all time. Wasn't that amazing? It really was. I agree. Well, Annie, thank you so much for taking time to talk with us, and I I hope to meet you one day in L.A. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Just ring me up if you're in the neighborhood. I won't take you to my humble apartment, but I'll I'll take you somewhere nicer. (laughs) I'll take you to Ron Meyer's house, and we can hide in the guest house. No one's thought about that. Oh, excellent. I would really (laughs) like that. I'm just kidding. Thanks for listening. Look for more Children of Genius shows in the future. U.S. Martis Radio is underwritten by Angela Roll, your special real estate agent for modernist houses, and by Nichiha.com slash U.S. Modernist. Visit U.S. Modernist.org's massive modernist archives to hear past shows, discover 7,000 mid-century houses, and get to 2.6 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. Contact George at george at usmodernist.org or on Instagram at mr.modernism. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Our esteemed guests get thoroughly Googled by Chief Researcher Cindy Stratton, not a real name, who wishes you all would stop trying to find her. Yeah, stop that. 
U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild, George, and I'll be back soon with another father-daughter dance episode of U.S. Modernist Radio.